to um, our Points of View lecture series. I am so pleased to be joined this evening by Nicolas Blanc, who um, is one of our Next at 90 choreographers and will be sharing a bit with us tonight about his piece for the Next at 90 Festival. Um, Nicolas began his dance training in France and after winning a scholarship for the 1994 Prix de Lausanne, he uh, continued his early dance education at the Princess Grace Academy in Monte Carlo and the Paris Opera Ballet School. He then went on to dance in Nice in Germany in Zurich and at San Francisco Ballet where he was made principal dancer in 2004. In 2009, he joined the Scottish Ballet as Ballet Master and has worked as a rehearsal director and principal coach for the Joffrey Ballet since 2011. While he was with us here in San Francisco, in 2005, he was named one of 25 to watch by Dance Magazine, and he also choreographed two pieces for San Francisco Ballet School in 2006 and 2007. Since joining the Joffrey, um, Nicholas has created several works, most, most notably Even Fall, Under the Trees Voices, and Beyond the Shore. And in 2016, he participated in the New York Choreographic Institute at New York City Ballet. His achievements also include his choreography award at the 2014 International Ballet Competition in Jackson, Mississippi, and his selection to participate in the National Choreographers Initiative in 2015. So welcome, Nick. It is so nice to have you here with us today. Thank you, Jenny. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for the nice introduction. <laughs> so we're going to mostly focus on your new ballet for the Next at 90 Festival. That's really where we'll have the bulk of our conversation. But before we jump into that, I do want to just go back in time a little bit and start at the beginning. So how did you become a choreographer? Was that something you always wanted to do? Did it come kind of as a surprise? Where did that start? So let's start with sort of a funny story. When I was 11 years old, um, at the start of the school year, you get this little file that you have to fill in about you know, parents' name, address, where do I live? Um, what do you want to do when you're an adult? And I always, since I was 11 years old, I always wrote dancer étoile and choreographer. Uh, so principal dancer and choreographer. So I was set. <laughs> and and you know, after, yeah. <laughs> so year after year, I, I kept writing that probably for a reason. And um, I, I sort of remember vaguely that I was 11 years old and I asked my dance teacher to create a small solo that I would perform on an outside stage that was for end of the year school show or something like that. So that was my first choreographic attempt. And then another surprising story that came back from, I don't know what memory, um, I was in at the Princess Grace Academy of Dance and I was about what, 14, 15? And I choreographed um, for myself again and three, um, three, three girls, a little dance on Apollo Musaget by Stravinsky. And I should have known by this age that um, Balan George Balanchine had done a ballet with, with that configuration. Ironically, um, yes. I, ironically, I didn't know, and I choreographed something like that. But to be um, more serious about, about the choreographic start, it was really, you know, starting at Zurich Ballet with the uh, Young Choreographer Workshop, and then on to Scottish Ballet also with another Young Choreographer um, Evening. And uh, I also did in, while I was during my time in Glasgow, I also did a, a dance residency with Dance House Glasgow, which was really interesting because it was not with uh, dancers coming from the ballet world, but from the modern dance world, and the experience was really different. Um, and then, and then moving on to the Joffrey, that's when you know Ashley Witter, the, the the artistic director of the Joffrey Ballet, gave me really the means and and the opportunities to go into grand scale. So, tell me a bit about this piece for San Francisco Ballet. Where did it start? Like, has it been? you know, the concept, has it been in the back of your mind for a while? Did it start, at, where did it begin for you? So, um, we, during the pandemic, I choreographed Under the Trees Voices for the Joffrey Ballet. 
and um, Helgi happened to see the digital version of it and and really liked the piece. And um, so Helgi gave me a call and invited me to participate to the festival, which I was completely over the, it was over the roof. I was so thrilled and, and so honored that he invited me. And then, you know, later on, when I, when I came to, to, to do the work in July, it was really wonderful to have such a warm welcome from um, Tamara as well and see again Helgi after so many years. But so when Helgi is calling me to, to tell me this, I'm, I'm really thinking, what, what do I want to do as a, as a piece for the festival? Is it, is it, um, is it um, sort of a show of peace, like, you know, not a show of peace, I shouldn't say that that way, but like um, a, a funny piece, a, a sparkling piece, what is really the, the, the atmosphere of the piece? I always start that way. I always try to find what is the atmosphere and the, the, con the context I want to get into. Um, and I was browsing for music and I remember talking last November um, to one of our pianists at the Joffrey Ballet, Jorge Ivars, who kind of gave me a list of, you know, um, pieces of, of music. And I, I'm, I'm in a coffee shop, I have my earphones on, and I, I listened to this one piece of music by Anna Klein. That was the third movement of that uh, cello concerto that I'm using. And I literally, I was so taken away by it. I was, it was, it took my breath away. And it took me a few months before I really decided to, to go with it, to go with that cello concerto. And the reason why I say that is because the, the other movements around this beautiful adagio are really complicated, rhythmically speaking, and the counts are, are very um, changing and the rhythms. And, and I thought, oh my God, can I handle this? I mean, it's one thing to love one little track of music, but can I handle the entire piece? And so after a few months, I said, okay, let's go with it. And, um, and, and, and that's, that's what happened. I, I least, so the, the point of departure was really the music. And then I, I met with my designer, Catherine Schnabel, who kind of um, influenced me on what was really, where was I going with the, the work? I was thinking, am I doing an abstract piece? Am I doing a narrative piece? And, and it, the result came out that it's a sort of what I would call a, a semi-narrative a semi piece or a semi-abstract piece. And the, the reason why I said that is because we, we have a poet in the piece um, and we do have um, dancers around the poet who are representing various things. Um, I don't know if you want me to dive more into the process of explaining the piece or... Well, that was gonna be my next question was, you know, I know there is this connection to poetry in mm -hmm. the piece. And if you could tell us a little bit about that and how it, it filters into the pieces, as you say, sort of semi-narrative. Yeah, so... Um, like I say, the music was the sort of the, 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 the catalyst. And I was looking at um, what Anna Klein, um, what, was, what, was she, what was her inspiration? And she based her, each movement of her cello concerto by, with a poem by uh, Rumi, um, the Persian poet from, you know, from the 12, 1300. And, um, and, 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 and this is why I was saying earlier, is it a narrative? Because at the beginning I thought, okay, I'm going to actually, I made a lot of, of research on, on Rumi's life. And I thought perhaps there is something there. But then I thought that in 26 minutes, it was sort of short to, to narrate about such a, 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 an, an incredible poet and who has been uh, read by millions and millions of, of people around the world. And, and I thought I was going to, to keep the figure of a poet. So there is that central figure of, of a poet and, and have um, other dancers around gravitate around him as his uh, thoughts, his emotions. But also at time, um, you know, like in the, in the third movement with Jennifer and Luke and Max, and I wanted to create a sense of a story having sort of um, the imagery of, um, of a family with a, a mother, a father, and a son. Um, 
at some point, you know, like for the for the second movement with Sasha and Wei doing the what I call the fast part, they are not so ma- so much seen as a representation of people, but more as is is sort of a tumultuous thoughts. Mm-hmm. So the, the people gravitating around the poet are essentially thoughts and emotions. Um, and then I, I, I was, so I'm, I'm in this um, the design studio of Catherine and I'm telling her, Catherine, I'm, I'm not sure where I'm going exactly yet with the piece. And I'm trying some garments. She's a fas- beautiful fashion designer. And I'm trying some, some garment on, sort of a blouse. And then she says, oh, wait, just put the blouse around your waist. And then the blouse became the sort of the drop of a medieval jacket. And that was sort of, for some reason, the, the, the clique that, and I, I turned around and I said to Catherine, oh my God, this is it. We have the start of the piece. I'm going to set the, the work into, in, in sort of a reconstructed medieval Persian time, although in a design, you might not see really that it belongs to the, to the medieval age. Um, but we wanted to get the inspiration of that. So we started to make research on, on the costu- Persian costume from, you know, 1300s and, and those gorgeous, beautiful colors and, and silk and, 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 and jackets. And it started like that. Um, and then the, the, it took sort of, it was sort of a snowball into how she designed the set and this grand landscape in the back with rolling dunes and and i'm very excited i can't wait (laughs) really exciting i'm I'm so excited to see that i you know so i i love how you've spoken about you know starting with the music this sort of sense of the sort of evocation of narrative or the central figure who has this sort of um, world around him and working with your designers. And so now I'm curious about how you work with your dancers. So when you walked into the studio, you know, what do you walk in with on that first day? How much do you know about what the piece is going to look like choreographically? How much of it emerges in, in dialogue with the dancers? What does that look like for you and for you specifically? Yeah. So, um, the preparation for the, I'm, I'm doing some sort of preparation for the piece before I enter the studio, which is what movement of the music is going to go for. Is it a duet? Is it a group scene? Is it a, a woman's dance? Um, and so once I have found what I think is the correct um, task for, the, for each movement, for each dancers, I'm also counting the music. And in that case, I can tell you it's been, it, hours and hours of counting and getting help because that was sort of a challenge. Um, but I think we did well in, at the end. But so I, it's a mix. I come in a studio with some sort of phrases, when mostly unison phrases, when I, I know that it's going to be a group dance. I like to start with having two or three phrases that I'm going to teach and that eventually the dancers are going to rework in terms of movement is it turning is it not turning in terms of musical phrasing when it comes to duets and when it comes to group scenes that are very um not unison where everyone is doing something creating a sculpture what i like to to call create this uh, create a sculpture i do that on a moment with them and it, and it takes a long time um so yeah it's a it's a mixed bag it's really a conversation between what i bring in and what what they what what they take and 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 take off with i imagine that that process changes really substantially depending on who that dancer is standing opposite you in the studio so can you tell us a little bit about working with san francisco ballet's dancers i mean if my math is right at least a few of the dancers you were working with were in the company with you. Right, you're right. And several of them were probably not. Is that a, that's right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sasha, I remember Sasha. I remember Jennifer. Uh, who else was there? Um, so from my group in, in my work, yes, Sasha and Jennifer were, um, I'm not going to call them babies when I was, <laughs> but they were, I think they were first year or 
apprentice of first year company when I was a principal there. Around 2006-ish. Something like that, yes. So to see those two women um, being principal dancers and gorgeous artists, it was so... I felt so joyous to, to have them in a group and and work with them and create something together. And yes, most of the group, I'm, as most of the company has changed since, since my time. And it was really exciting to work with new people. And, and you know, the, the, the truth about San Francisco Ballet artists is that they are really, they are a, a really strong bunch. And they are very talented artists, They're incredible technique, incredible artistry. They have seen a lot of reps, uh, danced a lot of reps. So, um, so I think that for me, coming back to San Francisco Ballet, I wanted to give them something that would challenge them as much as they would challenge me in, uh, in making the piece. Um, and I have to say they were on board immediately day one. We did the piece in 14 working days, which, I mean, amazing. Uh, and kudos to them because the last day, my last day in a, in, in a studio, we did our first run. And of course, there was there is still a lot of polishing when I look at the video, but um, they put the piece and, and tried to stay together as much as they could. And they did a really, really good job with stamina, with musicality. So it's really exciting to work with San Francisco Ballet. As you've been talking, it made me think you must have been here for the 2008 festival as a dancer. Yes, 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 that's right. Does that, yeah. did, when Helgi called you and asked you to participate in that, did you think back, like, oh my goodness, like what that process was like of working with all of those? That was, was that 10 choreographers perhaps? Or it, I don't think it was 12, it was. Uh, I forgot. Um, I, it was the 75th anniversary, right? Um, 75th, yes. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. I, I know that we had a lot to work on. <laughs> And, and like switch from one piece to another. So, yeah, it nice. was, I, I think that to bring so many choreographers in as, as a dancer point of view, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's a challenge because you have to remember all those various style and, 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 and choreographies. But at the same time, what, um, what an eye opener, what a, an, an experience to leave. It, it's fabulous. I was um, someone out there in in on the internet. One of our fans will correct me, but I'm wondering if perhaps you and Miles Thatcher are the only two to have both danced in one of our festivals and choreographed. Ah, interesting. Yeah, possibly. I, I can't, off the top of my head, think of anybody else who would have had the dual experience of both work yeah. in context and also dancing with it so i think you're probably right yeah just a little a little fun fact for yeah. everyone. so we're going to get the opportunity to take a little sneak peek um of this work in rehearsal um can you just give us a little bit um of context for our audience about what this clip is that we're about to look at mm -hmm. so this is the transition between the first movement and second movement so before the cello concerto is starting, I'm adding a soundscape, um, essentially built with sound of wind and in a desert and, and sand. Um, and so the, the essentially my, my second um, section um, is the first section of the cello concerto. So we are finishing with the solo that I'm creating for the poet who is um, sort of um, going through everyone as a solo and he's going to um, sort of get against, um, get his, his here against um, Jacob. And that um, relationship between Jacob and, and, and Max is really important because it's basically, uh, my interpretation of it is really about having his alter ego um, sort of reflecting for himself what he feels, uh, how he's um, emotionally speaking, um, what is his soul saying to, to him. Um, and the other interpretation that I have about this is also um, 
the fact that um, Rumi was very um, Rumi had a um, sort of um, a spiritual instructor. His name was Shams um, Fabrizi, um, who he met in, in, in twelve um, forty four precisely, and so that beginning i thought i wanted to have a male duet to kind of slightly have um have a little reminiscence of that relationship that he had with shams without being narrative and this is why we spoke at the beginning of of our conversation about is it a narrative or, or an abstraction um but anyway so the, the that 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 relationship is mirroring jacobs and max are mirroring each other and the other thing that was really interesting in the movement, in my opinion, is that at some point you were going to see Max fall. Um, so that's the end of the, um, exactly, that's the end of the, the first movement. Oh, the first entrance is sort of listening um, to, to what could be his heart, his soul. And Jacobs turns around. And there is sort of a, a mirroring effect that is about to happen here. And the movement wants to be very circular. Um, and then here, Max is fainting. And it is a bit like um, Jacob is here to sort of support the poet. And, and, and when I say Jacob, I should say the words of the poet are here to support the poet himself. Um, and I wanted the, the, the movement to be very round and very circular, to sort of give a bit of a a tribute to the dunes and the landscape we're going to see later in the piece as well. Lovely, wonderful. I love, it's such an evocative, even without hearing the sound, right? It's, it's such evocative movement and you really do, I think, see that relationship begin to emerge between them right from the get-go. So thank you for sharing. Having spoken a bit about your piece for this festival, I want to zoom out a little bit um, you know, one of the things that's so exciting about these festivals when San Francisco Ballet has programmed them is that we get to see choreographers, designers, musicians, composers from around the world come here to San Francisco and say a little something about how they see the world, how they see ballet, what they're excited about, what they think is next, right? Next at 90, not to mm -hmm. hammer on it too hard. But I'm wondering, what are some of the things that you are really excited about? in ballet right now or in dance more broadly? Are there um, certain people, certain ideas that you're seeing emerge that you think are really pushing this art form to its next place? Yeah, um, I think that right now, um, I love the idea of witnessing so much artistry and, and, and crafting um, all over the world. Uh, San Francisco Ballet at the Geoffrey, I'm, 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 right now we're working, we had, um, Annabelle Ochoa Lopez and Kathy Marston, who you guys know as well, um, choreograph uh, new work for us for the um, partnership with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra that will happen in November. And to see those two women um, crafting their work, it so, was so beautiful. Each of them having a very um, a particular voice. Um, Kathy has created a, a beautiful quintet. Um, about love and a family um, and um, Annabelle has created something, a plate, um, which she, she's introducing a non-binary um, dancer in, in one of the lead roles. And, and, so, and Chanel da Silva is right now creating with us a new work as well for the fall, for the fall program. And, and also in Chanel's, there is always that um, discussion about where, what, where do we want to bring dance and what is dance saying and what is the message that we want to convey and I think this is really important I think that in we are living in a, in a very disrupted world where it's going really fast no one is really listening to each other and and I feel that personally as, a, as an artist and a choreographer and I'm witnessing that with other creators that we need to step back and and and, and get a sense of what do we first what do we what do we want to say how do we touch an audience are they do are they getting touch or not or are they coming to the theater and and and, and get away after the show without 
feeling nothing. Um, and I think this is really important. And I, I'm, I'm glad that the, the, the world of dance and the world of ballet is still continuing to push the envelope forward and, 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 and dig, dig further in, 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 in what message we want to convey. Yes, I think you're so right, especially in this moment, right? There's something that dance can, can make people feel, right? And, and connect with. And the opportunity to do that is so powerful and is what will keep this art form moving forward, right? And, and relevant and impactful. And, and the art form can be about beauty and the art form can be a political message or a societal message. It, it can be anything, but I think it's really important to... Um, despite the fact that ballet has been, you know, over many decades, became, has become very athletic. I think the power of artistry and the power of um, emotion, and it's really, really important as well. So if you, in my opinion, if you combine uh, the way dancers are incredibly moving today with so much facilities um, and the, the combo between like I said, athleticism and artistry is something that we, we need to continue to nurture that. I think that is a perfect note to end on as we, as we conclude this. Thank you so much. Um, Thank Nick, you. Joining us today, or joining our audience today. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm so excited to see your piece on stage very soon. Thank you very much. I'm very excited. So welcome everybody. I'm really pleased to be joined today by Claudia Schreier, one of our Next at 90 choreographers to speak a bit about her new work for the festival. Um, after training at the Ballet School of Stanford under the direction of Stephanie Marini, Claudia continued her education at Harvard University, where she earned a BA in sociology and a secondary degree in dramatic arts. She immersed herself in the dance community in college, and her passion for ballet and her desire to continue nourishing her identity through dance led her to become a choreographer. Among her choreographic credits are commissions from Boston Ballet, Miami City Ballet, Dance Theater of Harlem, Vail Dance Festival, and Juilliard Opera, and of course now San Francisco Ballet. In 2019, her ballet for Dance Theater of Harlem, Passage, was the subject of the PBS documentary Dancing on the Shoulders of Giants, which won the Emmy Award for Best Documentary in the Capital Region. Claudia is a recipient of the Princess Grace Award for Choreography, the Lotus Foundation Prize, and the Suzanne Farrell Dance Prize. In addition, she was a Virginia B. Tolman Fellow at the Center for Ballet and the Arts at New York University. In 2018, she presented a TEDx talk titled Thinking on Your Feet at Columbia University, which centers the around the process of collaboration and revision in choreographing a dance. She has also served as Atlanta Ballet's choreographer in residence since 2020. So welcome, Claudia. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you for having me. So um, we're going to focus today really on your new piece for Next at 90. But before we do that, I just want to go back and start kind of at the beginning by asking, you know, how did you become a choreographer? Um, what was your path? I know it wasn't maybe the most traditional way into ballet choreography. So can you tell us a little bit about that path? And, you know, did you always know this was where you were going to end up? Or was it sort of a circuitous journey for you? Yeah, I love that question. I, I like to often say that my body knew before I did that I wanted to be a choreographer. Uh, my parents like to tell stories about me dancing around the kitchen before dinner um, as a young child, but there was something about it that wasn't just a love for dance. It was a love for creating movement and a love for kind of, uh, you know, melding steps with music. Music has always been a part of my life from, from very uh, young, uh, from a very young age. And I think that that has become a parallel track for me over the course of my life. And so ballet, um, was the the basis upon which all this has been built, but making dance, making ballet, kind of finding my own way through ballet has been an entirely different journal uh, journey for me. Um, and you're right, I I didn't follow the the path of a traditional choreographer. I did not dance for uh, a company, but rather went to college and honed my love for choreography there. Not by studying it, um, as you mentioned, I didn't study dance. I studied sociology but the dance program and the, my colleagues and my, my instructors who were there um, really supported me in my love for investigating this, this art form that um, 
that I was interested in. And so through creating throughout my college years and then taking on a number of opportunities uh, post-graduation and so on and so forth, um, I am very lucky to now find myself doing this professionally all day, every day. And it's just my, my first and long time love. I love that. I, as someone who also, you know, danced growing up and then went to college and thought I, you know, majored in something else, thought I was doing something else. It's so fascinating how you can find your way back, right? Mm -hmm. The art form in different ways and then make a, make a career of it. I mean, I do something very different than you, but it's, um, I think a lot of times you think once you go to Harvard, right, that that's it. And in fact, it's not, right? I think that's such an inspiring story for students, right? Who are looking at what's next for them. It, it doesn't mean that, right? There are other ways to be in the, in the world. So um, I want to, as I said, focus on this piece that you're making for San Francisco Ballet. So tell us a bit about its genesis. Where did it come from? What is its concept or idea? And like, how long have you been thinking about it? You know, did it come about for this in particular? Have you been thinking about it for many years? Where did it come from? Um, this ballet, which I have titled Kin, um, has, I think, multiple origins, one of which is just, I mean, I actually remember I was sitting in this exact room. Um, I'm currently in Virginia where my, my in-laws live and it was the middle of the pandemic. And um, I got a call from Helgi inviting me to be a part of this festival. And I'm sure anyone can imagine at that time, just the, 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 <laughs> the mind twist it is to be kind of, you know, in isolation, um, unable to, to create the way that we're accustomed to, and then just get the world's most exciting and incredible invitation to, to make dance on, um, you know, the most extraordinary company one can imagine. So it truly was this beacon for me. And it's this, it's been this light this whole time to know that as we were on some version of the other side of this, I had this extraordinary opportunity to, to enjoy, to take advantage of. So that's the, you know, the, the pure origin story. And on top of that, um, I discovered again during the pandemic music by this incredible composer, young composer, young female composer named Tanner Porter. Um, it was a work of hers called Six Sides from the Shape of Us, which is not the music I'm using for San Francisco. However, she reorchestrated this beautiful string quartet for my work that I premiered in uh, for Boston Ballet earlier this year in March. And um, I, I'm, I've just been so entranced by her vision and her, her, the way that she communicates through music and we, we work together incredibly well. And, and I've just been literally moved by, by her voice. And so when it came time to, um, to decide what I was doing for this ballet, I knew that I wanted to attach myself to that energy and to, to take the risk to, to commission music for this festival and make something new um, featuring a, a California-based artist. She's from California originally. Um, and to to delve into what it, it might mean to have this this female duo team um, craft something new for the for the SF stage. Am I right to say that you've worked often with new commissions or living living composers? I feel like that's a really sort of unique um, not that plenty of people don't, right? But it's sort of a spe it's a special thing to do. Is that something that you really like to do in your work? Is to work with living and or new? I absolutely do. Um, it's it's kind of when I when I look back at my own trajectory and and the journey I've taken as I find music. It used to be always Bach. I was like Bach was <laughs> my guy, and there is something about the the interplay of the the the, the rhythms and the emotional quality of, of that era that I always gravitated toward. And I think as I have developed as a choreographer, that seed is still there, but I think I seek it in new ways and new voices. And I'm looking to see how can you take that essence? How can you take that, that musical seed that people respond to so viscerally? Um, but how can you find that in new voices who haven't yet, um, you know, become so well known that we're also familiar with their work. And there's just, there's a lot of genius out there. There's a lot of musical genius um, swimming around at all times. And so to be able to just kind of have the opportunity to, to kind of envelop yourself in that and to, to also kind of 
influence it. That's the other crazy thing about being able to collaborate with a living artist. Um, you are not only benefiting from learning from them in real time, but you can also influence the process and help shape something that ends up being this entirely new creation that wouldn't have existed without that that relationship between composer and, and choreographer. And I really value that. That's wonderful. So kind of continuing on that idea, I always like to ask about the first day in the studio, you know, what you walk in with, where you start. And I'm, I'm asking that question, but I'm also going to ask, you know, with a new with new commissioned music, did you walk in with a completed score or is it was it still in the process of being created on that first day? It was still in the process of being created. It was it was mostly done. What what ended up changing over the course of the three weeks during the rehearsal process was um, in the moment adaptation. I would I would work with the dancers during the day and then I would go to Tanner in the evening and say, you know what, we might need a little bit more here or this this might need a little bit more breath or we might need to rework this entire section. And so as I was learning um, about what we needed for the piece, it was very much happening in, in real time. Um, so structurally it was all there. Um, and in terms of like the plan for the work that was all there. So I would say of all the challenges that they um, encountered, it was staying on top of the complex rhythms and the complex counts that we have crafted for, and that Tanner has crafted for this ballet, which is what gives us its drive. Um, but it means that we have to internalize a lot of different counts that then the audience should never know that we are, are thinking about. So it's kind of getting into the nitty gritty and then undoing all of that to make it a very natural performance. And that's been a really uh, welcome challenge and one that um, wove itself into the process from the start as well. Um, but to answer your question about day one, um, it's just such an amazing thing to walk in. First, you, you watch company class, you already have your dancers, but you at least want to get a sense of who everyone is and um, what their general movement styles are and just kind of take a lay of the land. And the energy in the studio is just so palpable. Um, they just, they go for it, whether it's, you know, Grand Allegro at the end or the very first thing you're teaching them as you start your workshop process, they are just all in, they are consummate professionals and they really can do anything. And that just makes it such an amazing and exciting process. And do you, you work in sort of a workshop model? Like, do you start with some phrases that they work on through a week and then start assembling things together? Or do you come in really knowing like, this is the arc of the ballet and I'm going to teach it from beginning to end. Like what's your, what does that look like for you in the studio? Yeah. So typically it depends per project for this one. It ended up being more of a workshop process where I had these movement, um, movement moments that we would then um, duplicate and reverse and extrapolate. And then the, the ballet, uh, the, the moments themselves repeat throughout the piece in different ways. And so that was my way of kind of discovering who would do what and then assign it throughout. As you're generating that movement, do you tend to work, like do you make, build movement on yourself, on your own body? Do you have dancers improvise? What does that look like in your yeah, I, I tend to take a lot of time first with the music, just sitting with the music and internalizing that. And then I will get on my feet and for several hours, usually early in the morning before rehearsal and in the weeks leading up to the choreographic process, um, I will craft phrases that I will then notate. I take videos. I have a very long Google document that is broken down by section and by time code and by um, you know the, diff the principle versus core. And so I try to, especially for something like this that's ensemble based and that has a lot of moving parts. I need to make sure that I'm able to keep track of who's doing what. So it ends up being, um, there ends up being like an academic component <laughs> to it on the back end that no one really sees. Um, and then when I get into the studio, that's where the freedom comes from. It's, it's seeing, because these answers are capable of so much more beyond sometimes what my brain can even conceive of on my own. It's it's having that adaptability and that flexibility to respond to what they hear, what they feel, and kind of finding a, a middle of the two. If you're willing, dive in a little deeper on this piece in particular. You said it's called Kin. What was, you know, is there a certain theme or story or idea that you're exploring in the course of this work? There, yes, there are two recurring themes in this work. One is um, speaking to the inevitability and passage of time and the pressure that comes out of that. 
The other is we follow a, a the relationship between two primary female characters, and we're not entirely sure throughout who they are. We know that one kind of has a little bit more of a predominance over the group than the other. She tends to be more of a, a directive spirit, um, but there's a, a very clear connection between the two of them that we follow throughout, and sometimes it can be um, supportive, sometimes it's more of a, a teaching role, sometimes it can be adversarial. And so between that, it's kind of like following the course of a relationship over the passage of time and seeing how that ultimately uh, results. And we've spoken a bit about your collaboration with your composer. Can you tell us anything about sets or costumes or other collaborators in this work? Who are they and what are they bringing to the table? Can yes. You- um, so lighting is by Jim French, who's doing all the lighting for the festival. Um, and I was had the pleasure of speaking with him very early on, even before I got to San Francisco. And I just love, uh, I love talking to him because he has a choreographic mind, even though he uh, his, his profession is lighting. And the way he talks about the relationship between light and music and, and light and movement, um, I found really inspiring and, and I'm very excited to, to get in the theater with him and, and make it all happen. Uh, my costumes are by Abigail Holston. I've worked with her a few times before. Um, I met her at Atlanta Ballet and she did my uh, costumes for Miami City Ballet as well earlier this year. Uh, I just absolutely love working with her. And then my set is by Alexander Nichols, who's also well known um, with uh, San Francisco audiences. Yes, for sure. I'm wondering about, it sounds like both with costumes and with music, you're working with someone you've worked with over time. What is that like getting to sort of reprise these relationships as you're working on new pieces and how is that different than working with someone you know entirely new to you yeah it's a real it's a blessing um you don't always have the opportunity to bring back um collaborators from previous projects but what you have is a um you're you're cultivating your your collective vision like there you, there's a shorthand that develops like once you've done something over the course of many projects or months or years you get to know that person in a new way you get to know how they think and you kind of find that Venn diagram of 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 where you align in terms of of bringing a, a vision to life and, and a theme to life um and everything from the big questions of what does this all mean to, should we be using this kind of stitch or that kind of stitch? And how's that gonna impact the stretch of the Lycra? Um, you learn so much by having that kind of intimacy with a collaborator. And it just, I think becomes more of a symbiotic relationship because you're able to um, kind of dig in a little bit more each time, I think. There's that that familiarity that grows over, over the course of, of the projects you work on together. So we are gonna have the opportunity to look at a little sneak peek um, of a moment of this work in rehearsal. Can you just give us a quick, um, just sort of uh, situate us in the ballet? What are we about to look at? Sure, so in this excerpt, this is, we are seeing our core um, at the uh, end of section one into section two. And it's one of the more, I would say, architectural or structural moments in the ballet. Um, as I described before, we're kind of looking at this, this journey that develops and this relationship that develops between these two female characters. Um, and you will see them, uh, Doris Andre and uh, uh, Misa Karnaga are, are playing those, those dual roles. Um, but there is a lot of environment that I've that I craft around these two female characters throughout. And so this is, this becomes a little bit more angular, a little bit more, um, I guess you could say like neoclassical in nature, maybe not, <laughs> um, but it's um, a, an um, opportunity to create kind of like a garden of people that the uh, characters then find themselves in. Great, all right, so I'm gonna share and then you can feel free to sort of talk over and let us know what we're The other thing I wanted to mention is that because this is an ensemble ballet, you will notice that principals and soloists and core members quite often are sharing a lot of the same responsibilities and the same roles. And I've very much appreciated how um, team oriented the, the company members are. 
they are constantly in the back helping each other out and discussing um, how to clarify certain steps and what the best grip is for things. And it just speaks so much to the company culture of SFB. And I so deeply appreciate that because it has really aided me in, in creating this work. And here in the center, you see our two female characters, principal female characters. I love how you really do see, as you said, the sort of architectural and sculptural ideas at work there. You know, you're really creating um, shapes, right? With with depth and height and variation that it's it's really quite striking. It's really beautiful. Thank you. So um, I want to zoom out a little bit. You know, one of the exciting things about these festivals that San Francisco Ballet has done um, over time is that you get to see, you know, nine or 12 choreographers' visions of kind of like what, what now is in ballet or what's next, right, in ballet. And so I'm curious for you, as you look across the field, what are some things that you find exciting? Who are, you know, whether that's particular choreographers or themes or ideas, just what do you, what do you see coming next? Uh, for this art form and what are you excited about? I love that there is a more pointed attention being paid to um, bringing in a, a, a wider array of voices. Um, when I was um, creating, I there were two other women um, with me. I mean, how, how often, we won't all be on the same program, but the fact that there are so many women who are lending their voice to this program, so many people of color who are lending their voice to this program. Um, that, of course, as we all know, has not been the case. And the fact that there is a, a concerted effort to diversify the voices, contributing not only to the Next at 90 festival, but to programs and festivals around the country, around the world, is essential to the survival of ballet as an art form and as a practice that is deserving of our attention, of our efforts, of our funding, and, and so many other things. So I am particularly excited to, to see that developing as, a, as an initiative. Um, and on the flip side, seeing, you know, when I would come out of rehearsal, at the end of the day, um, I would see a line of girls in their little leotards and pink tights and shoes line up. And, uh, you know, that that matters so much as well, seeing that the, the change in, in skin tone, like noticing that um, there are little girls who look like me who are trotting down the aisle to go meet their mothers um, speaks to, you know, the efforts of the San Francisco Ballet School to increase diversity. And those are the faces that we're going to see on stage five, 10, 20 years from now. And so to, to, to experience in real time, like just the top down changes that are occurring shows that there are real efforts being made and that are going to have real life impact. And that's, that's just my whole, that's my whole life right there from, you know, telling my story as a little girl growing up dancing to what I'm doing now. Um, it's, it's seeing that change and that's, that's very exciting to me. And, and I will say, you know, I think for our students in the school to see you in the front of the studio is also, right, it's part of this process, right, that they can see themselves in the front of the studio as a choreographer, you know, working with our dancers is so important to their longevity in the art form and their continued pursuit of what they want to do, right? So it is that really beautiful full, full circle there. So thank you for that too. So that sort of wraps up. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. And I think sort of wraps up what I wanted to ask you about today. Um, we're so excited to see Ken on stage uh, in January and February this year. And best of luck as you put the finishing touches uh, on the work in the upcoming months. So thank you so much, Claudia, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jenny. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here for uh, this evening's points of view conversation. We are here today with principal dancer T. Helmets, who will be discussing 
um, our resident choreographers, Yuri Posikov's new ballet for the next It 90 festival. So Yuri, as I mentioned, is our choreographer in residence here at San Francisco Ballet and creating a new piece for Next at 90. His ballets are known for their thoughtfulness, musicality, expressive dancing, and dynamic partnering. Yuri began his training with the Bolshoi Ballet and from there fell in love with the art form. He continued with the Bolshoi for 10 years before spending two years with the Royal Danish Ballet and then joining San Francisco Ballet as a principal dancer in 1994. Over the next 12 years, he danced ballet's leading, ballet's leading roles while beginning to choreograph on his friends and fellow dancers. He has created more than 14 ballets for San Francisco Ballet, including Magritte Mania, which won the Isadora Duncan Dance Award for Outstanding Choreography, Raku and Swimmer, among many others. His other choreographic credits include Nutcracker for Atlanta Ballet and Anna Karenina, which was a co-commission between the Joffrey Ballet and the Australian Ballet in 2019. Yuri is a frequent guest with the Bolshoi Ballet, where he's choreographed multiple full lengths, including A Hero of Our Time, Nureyev, and most recently, The Seagull, which premiered in July of 2021. His inspiration for his Next at 90 piece came from George Balanchine's Stravinsky Violin Concerto, and he remembers the muscle movement and music of the work since he has performed it. The music has a contemporary feel, even though it was composed in 1931. And although Balanchine's ballet differs greatly from Pasakoff's, he felt compelled to use this music to express himself and what he feels it can convey. And here to tell us a bit about this ballet today and what it is conveying and expressing is, as I said, T. Helmets, who, before joining San Francisco Ballet, was a principal dancer with the Birmingham Royal Ballet and the Estonian National Ballet, where he made history in Estonia by being the youngest male dancer to ever perform the role of Siegfried in Swan Lake. As a principal dancer with us here at San Francisco Ballet, Tate has danced major roles in Helgi Thomason's Giselle, Nutcracker, Sleeping Beauty, and Swan Lake, among others, as well as principal roles in ballets like John Cranko's On Yegan, John Neumeyer's Little Mermaid, Liam Scarlett's Frankenstein, and Christopher Wilden's Cinderella. And he has a repertory of works, including ballets by Ashton, Balanchine, Bentley, Forsyth, Macmillan, and Von Maughan among, of course, many others. In terms of Yuri Posikov's work, he's danced in Firebird, Swimmer, and Magritomania, um, and is working closely with Yuri on this new work for the next in 90 Festival. So we're really thrilled to have him with us today uh, to talk about Violin Concerto. So welcome, T. Thank you for having me. So there's so much that we could talk about together, about your career, about your work. But today we are really going to focus on this new ballet uh, that Yuri is creating for Next at 90. And so I'd love to go back uh, to the beginning a little bit of your relationship with Yuri. How did you two first start working together and kind of what brought you into this particular position uh, for Violin Concerto? So I have admired Yuri as a dancer for a long time. And when I joined in 2005, it was actually Yuri's last year as a dancer with the company. So I saw him. Uh, we got cast many times in sing roles, and um, he was just phenomenal. I've never seen anybody like that on the stage. He's just such an inspiration. And, and I don't know how or why, but I remember that one day he just simply approached me, said, um, um, would you be able to set my ballet? Because I had danced in his ballets before and uh, I don't know why but he just said okay uh, well you've danced this ballet I need somebody to go to Nevada to Vegas and stage Firebird and I was like okay that's it sounds good you know I that sounds exciting so that's how it started we went together we cast it and then after that because he was busy, it was just all up to me. I was in charge of every aspect of the ballet. With connections with San Francisco Ballet and, and all of that. And um, yeah, it was really, it was really fun to sort of do all of these different aspects of, of management. And uh, yeah, that's, and then after that, it was um, we had many projects actually, which got canceled, unfortunately, during COVID. Uh, I was supposed to go and set a swimmer in Hamburg and, and many others in Oregon Valley. And, and it's just, um, it was just unfortunate. But yeah, I really, um, 
um, it's it's been a really really great working relationship. Um, I feel like he trusts me and and uh, I understand what he is looking for. So I emphasize on all of those things for him. When you went to set Firebird in Nevada, was that the first time that you had been like the rehearsal director for a ballet or like what what was that like for you? Was that a n- totally new experience or had you done some of that elsewhere? I had done, I had uh, worked this Val a little bit before, but just on a, like a little piece, like he would just say, uh, you know, why don't you help this person with his aria or something and make sure that it looks correct because I'm not there or even on double stop. Uh, I know that he asked me to go in and work with Betsy before she went to New Zealand because, you know, I had created this, but never ballet, never ballet. And so this was the first time. And, um, and it was challenging because um, the company was smaller and there were not as many dancers and um, yeah it was it was fun it was really fun because uh, we lacked a lot of men and so Yuri decided in Firebird to say well why does it have to be men let's just use women as monsters too and so it was a really great it was just a great new perspective it was really fun the ladies just loved it they it was it was a great experience I love that. And so tell me about for Violin Concerto, you know, when did you, when were you asked to participate in this process? What did that, did you know, you know, well in advance? Did you know what he was planning or, you know, how did it come about that you were involved in this creative process really from the beginning, right? Yes. Yeah. Right away, uh, even before Yuri started, he said right away, I want you to be part of this. I want you, I want you to do this with me and, and so I knew, I knew right away to be ready, and and I was really excited about it. But it kind of terrified me when he said Stravinsky Violin Concerto, because that music is really something. And um, actually, it was really wonderful what he did. He really he helped me out a lot. So we went to studio, and because. I read music as well. So we took a score, we opened this up. And when we just really went through, he said, okay, see how it just it goes from, you know, threes to random thing. And then it's fives and it we just broke it down. And we, um, he had this great system of writing it down and the phrases. And then the way that he broke down the music, it helped me out so much that now when we started, it really, um, it was not at all difficult for me. I knew exactly the counts. I know in what phrases they are. I could work really quickly with the pianist, you know, say go from 57 instead of like, oh, what is that? You know, like I knew exactly where to go from. So it was very helpful to have a quick rehearsal process. Mm -hmm. So I'm really thankful for him for that because that that uh, system, it really worked really well. So, you know, you were working closely with Yuri. You are not Yuri, of course, but you know, I read in this bio and his bio as we were going through that he was in fact inspired by the Balanchine in some ways, or that was in his mind. I'm wondering, what did he tell you about, you know, the genesis of this idea or why he was selecting this or how it, how it came about? As you said, it's, it's very difficult music and it's very closely associated with an existing ballet, right? So it's it's a really interesting choice. And I'm wondering if he spoke to you at all about that process, that thought process. Yes, we had we had a little conversation about it. He actually said that he was inspired by the music. Mm-hmm. And he he said that that every time he choreographs, it's it's about the music, the first thing that it comes from music and also as he was thinking about what he wanted to do for the festival so he 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 said to me as a it was a sign so he said that i opened up the computer and i started searching for music and that stravinsky violin concerto was right there and he was like okay this is it this is the sign i have to do this 
and and uh, yeah, so he said that uh, the ins the biggest inspiration comes from music. Mm -hmm. And um, I imagine you've performed the balance sheet too. Yes, you've done yes. it. Yes, yes, I've done both of the arts. Yeah. So what? How was that for you as you approached this from this different? perspective and I imagine at least some of the dancers in the piece too like also have done both what is that like for you as you kind of enter into it in this new way did it feel just completely separate or did it did you feel a connection between the two works in your own body I'm, I'm curious I don't see the connection mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of wonderful yeah because I do know I um I do know the, the balance inversion really well and there are certain steps and certain rhythms. And, and I don't know how Yuri did this, but there is just, I would say there's no connection whatsoever. It is completely fresh new take on this classic. And it is so much fun to watch the dancers throw themselves into this. It looks so fresh and so fun and I, I just, I love every moment I watch it. And it's like, I would have never been able to unsee or something that's been drilled into my brain for years of just doing the Stravinsky violin concerto. And this is so fun and so new. I, I absolutely love it. That's, that it is, it's really remarkable, right? When you have such a, such a reference point to be able to do something completely different, it, that it really is a mark of, of great creativity. So tell me a little bit about how Yuri works in the room. You know, does he come in with things already prepared? You know, do you and he work outside of the studio and then bring movement to the dancers? Does he work very directly on the dancers? Is there improvisation? What does that look like within the creative process or for this piece specifically? Yeah. He comes prepared. He has sequences of music that he really wants to get down first. And he doesn't go chronologically. Mm -hmm. He goes, okay, so this is that rhythm. I feel this rhythm right here. Let's tape this, let's get this down. And, and I remember there were a couple of times at the end, as you recall, there is like a lot of rhythm changes. It goes from fours to sixties and the sevens and then there's fours to fives and all of this different rhythm. So he he said, I want to hit the note. I want to hit the note, but I want to keep the rhythm of the feet. And so we would work out in the studio of the rhythm of the feet and then trying to add in the the the, the sound for the arms. And and it's it's difficult. It's very much like a, one of those things where you're um, trying to get it in your body, but it's not impossible. It's really fun. It's really fresh. And so he does come prepared and and he, for this piece, he didn't go chronologically. He would just go, okay, put this away. I, I can't look at this right now. Let's tape this, let's put it in a book. And then I wanna keep the boys now for the next bit. And so it it didn't really come together until the very last week where we knew exactly what it was. And even then, um, we pay very close attention to where, where are the gaps, where are the, the connection gaps of how does this person get to now to this side and that side. So um, it, it was like a fun puzzle. It was a really fun puzzle, but he was prepared all the time. Yeah. And then tell me a bit about what what your role, like really specifically with this ballet was. Like what, what did a day for you look like in the in the process of making this ballet? I. I had to closely watch the music. I had to keep a, a close record on the music and making sure that uh, that the full phrases are done of the phrase that he wanted to do. Um, recording everything, every rehearsal was recorded. And um, I, I was just there to make sure that we're continuing and we're working it out. And if there's any questions or any other possibilities, but really it was, uh, it was just creating an environment where he he just can constantly give, 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 and keeping uh, kind of a, a positive atmosphere in the studio. 
Wonderful. So we've talked a bit about, quite a bit really about the music, right? As this sort of origin point for this ballet. Are you able to tell us anything about for the other collaborators or other um, pieces that are gonna come together in this work? Sets or costumes or light? What, what else is going on that we can expect to see as audience members? Yes, there are other pieces. And the great thing is uh, over here, we have everybody in the same building so that we can go, I can go to production quickly and check an update on something, or I can go to costume department, check an update. And uh, so, yes, I've, I've seen the costumes, I've seen the sets. Um, it's a fun set. Oh, this is a real set for it. Yes, it's a, it's, well, it's a, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a real set. I don't know what it's going to look like in the, in the real life, but um, it, it can create a really beautiful atmosphere. There is maybe uh, a tiny bit anxiety about it because it does <laughs> require dancers to try it out. Mm. We, um, we have a, um, a sort of a curved ballet bar that goes across from the back and there is a lot of work uh, especially for the ladies that they do holding onto the bar, which is really, really fun and really exciting. And uh, so we don't know how it's going to work yet. So, uh... <laughs> Together very quickly. You're not going to get weeks and weeks in advance to work with it, I don't think. No, and but, but the dancers, uh, so we have good dancers because they are really, it's the kind of group that is going to go with the flow and is going to make it work. I can tell their heart is in it. So I know that they we, we will all coll collaboratively find a way to figure this out. And the costumes are really beautiful. Sandra Woodall has done a wonderful job. I've seen the costumes there. She's always able to make the dancers look so good. So I'm always, uh, so I'm looking forward to um, seeing how they, how they uh, look in the costumes, everybody together. Wonderful. So we have um, a little sneak peek uh, of the work in rehearsal. So I'm gonna share my screen and you'll be able to see this. And then if you can just kind of narrate over and let us know what we're looking at. Bars. So yeah, there are ballet bars and uh, the ladies are using it for balance. Um, so this is a, uh, uh, like a quartet, but it's really just two principal couples, not the principal couples, but another set of principal couples. And it's, um, they're dancing in this ballet, I would say is kind of fun, energetic, extremely difficult <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah, just full of joy. Uh, so this is the leading principle. It's uh, Josh here. And uh, as you can see, very busy footwork, lots of steps, um, very musical, uh, super energetic. Yeah. Yes, lots of steps. That's, that's really, you really see that in there. It's, it's the music has so much going on and then you really see uh, how Yuri is, is hearing kind of every beat of that music and translating it into movement. It's quite something. Yeah, it's, it is full of a lot of steps, I would say. And uh, the dancers are unbelievable. I, I don't know how they can get it all into their body, how they can get it in. Um, it's, it's fun to watch because it seems like it's, it's almost impossible. It should be impossible to put that many to be able to do that many steps so well, so musically. So it's, it's, uh, it's really fun. It's really fun to watch that. For you, is it different doing this kind of work, this kind of, you know, rehearsal director work with your colleagues, like with the dancers you work with every day versus going to Nevada or, you know, anywhere else that you could go? Is there a difference for you in that? It's fun for me because I don't get to be around them as much, I would say, in all of the rehearsals. You know, I, I might just go and do my principal rehearsal, then 
hang around in a lounge or go home or, you know, yeah. but I, I'm not there in a studio. So also just like for Yuri, I would say for me as well is looking at the dancers with the, like a refreshed new lens. I'm, I'm, I don't know what they're capable of because I'm not around them every day in the rehearsal studio. And it's really fun seeing them push themselves so hard and uh, finding out that they're, you know, they have all these abilities. Yeah, yeah, all these things that you didn't know necessarily. Yeah, that's wonderful, that's beautiful. So, you know, one of the things that as audience members we find so uh, invigorating about these festivals, right, is that we get to see so many different ideas of what ballet can be or might be on stage, all kind of back to back to back to back over a couple of weeks, right? It's it's a really exciting time for the audience to get this sense of where ballet is going or where it's going next, right? And so I'm curious for you, sitting where you are as a principal dancer, but also as you know, someone who's working closely with choreographers in new ways as the parent of a ballet dancer, right? What are some of the things that you're really excited about in ballet right now as you look kind of across the field? What do you feel like is um, exciting or new or different out there in the ballet world? I don't even know if I have like a really solid answer to that. That's a big question. Um, what I do enjoy is is uh, is for sure is how Yuri uses classical technique and uh, uses the aspects of character dance, which is which we get to see so little in America. I feel especially, but that's is that is something that's very ingrained in us in in Europe and in our training. So I'm really glad because I can relate to the importance of that. And I also can relate to the fact that those are the traditions that will be really good to see them kept alive and continuing on in a new, refreshing way. And in his ballet, you get to see those aspects of, of little character dance, not super stylized, but stylized in his own way. And um, the importance of musicality and the importance of still classical technique, something that we train every day and work every day in ballet class. So it's it's nice to see the continuation of that. And I would I would hope to see that more mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah, the ways to bring that classical vocabulary into what the into the new, right? That it can still be ballet, right? As it as it becomes more. Exactly. Exactly. Lovely. All right. Well, thank you so much, T. This was a wonderful conversation. I think uh, we all got a little glimpse into this creative process, and we're so excited to see Violin Concerto on stage uh, in January. So thank you so much for taking the time, and uh, good luck as we get into the festival proper. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Please visit the website to learn more about San Francisco Ballet's 2023 season and our many educational offerings.